Good afternoon. Welcome to a special Zoom recording of the Quaker tradition. My name is Terry Helton, and I am president of the Ventura County Interfaith Community. And we did this as a live presentation on March 28th and had technical difficulties. So we are doing a special recording with Percy Hicks Severn this afternoon and myself. And we are hoping that people will enjoy this presentation. Um, I enjoyed it when I heard it live on Tuesday. So I hope everybody here will enjoy it. Before we have Percy speak, I will remind everybody that watches this video that Ventura County Interfaith Community has a website. And if you've if you enjoyed this, there are other events you can include and I will share I will share that website with you so you can see this is an opportunity of doing things virtually. This is the web the website. It is Ventura County Interfaith Community. It's vcic.info and the recent post would be the Quaker tradition and funeral and burial practices and various faith traditions that we will be hosting at Padre Serra on April 25th at 7 p.m. with three people, uh, Father Patrick from Padre Serra, Thapo, a Buddhist monk, and Rabbi Mike Lotker will be talking about funerals and burial practices in their various faiths. So saying that, I would like to introduce Percy hicks Severn who has been a part of Ventura County Interfaith Community since 2006. She's part of the longstanding core group, and she has been a Quaker for over 30 years. And come to find out, she has a long tradition of this in her family. More importantly, I'd like to share that I personally know uh, Percy has been involved with many things in the community and all things that promote education and peace. Um, one of those she'll speak about tonight is the Afghan Girls School that was established when um, the 9-11 happened and Afghan girls were uh, escaped over the border from Afghan to Pakistan. So she'll briefly speak about that. So I don't want to delay any further and I will introduce Percy now. Good evening. To understand the Religious Society of Friends, one has to go back to the 16th century England, where the Church of England, Anglican, was the state-sponsored church, and no other church was allowed. Now, originally, the state church was the Catholic church with the Pope as the head. However, Henry VIII was desperate to get a divorce so that he could remarry someone who could give him a male heir. His first wife had given him a daughter, Mary, but could, could not give him any more children. Henry didn't want a daughter, that is, a queen, but a son to follow him as King of England. He broke away from Rome and founded the Church of England. Now, anyone who practiced Catholicism was punished severely. His next wife gave him another daughter, poor Henry. But his next wife gave him a son. However, Edward VI only lived to be 15, so that the first daughter, Mary, became the queen. And she was known as Bloody Mary because she put anyone to death who wasn't a Catholic. She died childless so that her half-sister, Elizabeth, the daughter of Henry's second wife, became a Protestant queen. And she probably put more Catholics to death than her sister Mary had, Protestants. Elizabeth had no heirs. After a long reign, so England went to Scotland and found the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who was Elizabeth's first cousin, to be King James I of England, followed by his son, James II, his son, Charles I, who was beheaded. At this point, England was in turmoil, the mid 17th century, and it turned into a civil war. Besides the turmoil of civil war, England had a highly stratified society. There was the upper class and everybody else. Even the language reflect, reflected this. If you were upper class, it was you, but if not, it was thee and thou and thy. In the middle of this came a young man, George Fox, son of a weaver, 
born in 1624, looking for spiritual answers. He left home at 18, but was rebuffed by the established Church of England. The clergy usually were the younger sons of the upper class. Looking at Fox as someone beneath them, they wouldn't give him the time of day. After wandering around in deep spiritual thought, he realized that there was that of God in everyone. But one couldn't reach God through ministers or pastors, but only through introspection of the light within or the inner light. The inner light was the direct awareness of God that allows a person to know God's will. Central to the Quaker message is the belief that each person has a direct in access to the mind of God by the medium of the inward light of Christ. Friends see this light described in John 1, 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The idea of the inner light caused a revolution at a time when it was known that women didn't have souls. But if there was that of God in everyone, women must have souls. What a revelation. George Fox preached in homes on greens and from hills, including Pendle Hill, rising nearly 2,000 feet in Lancashire in Northwest England on Pentecost Sunday. He reported a vision that he was given to see, a great people to be gathered. This vision inspired him to travel throughout England and later Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Holland, Germany, and the British colonies in the West Indies and North America preaching, Christ Jesus has come to teach his people himself. Gradually, he got a large following, mostly of people from the middle sort, country people and farmers. Now, Fox had a magnet magnetic personality, and although he didn't have much formal education as far as we know, he read extensively and wrote legibly. Fox wrote, there is one, even Christ Jesus, that can speak to thy condition. One of the main Quaker writers, Robert Barclay, stated that the inner light is never separated from God nor Christ. But wherever it is, God and Christ are wrapped up therein. Calling themselves the Religious Society of Friends, or Friends for short, many friends, due to their unorthodox beliefs, got in trouble with the authorities. They refused to pay tithes to the established church, for which they could be thrown in prison. Leaving their children unattended, other friends would take care of the children, and also take care of the family business. Friends would also take food to the prison because the prison didn't usually provide any. Other reasons friends got in trouble was by refusing to honor officials by doffing the cat, their hat. It was called hat honor. When a person met someone of the upper class, they were required to doff their hat. And if they didn't, they'd find themselves in front of a judge. In 17th century England, one would address the upper classes with you and the lower classes with thee and thou or thy, which I mentioned before. Friends would, while standing before a judge, address him as thee, a very serious insult and one that could get a person in prison. One judge was so incensed with friends that he stormed sarcastically, they quake at the sight of the Lord. Gradually, many people insulted the friends by calling them Quakers, and it stuck. Almost 400 years later, we are still called Quakers. In fact, if someone asks me what my religion is, I say I am a Quaker. If I say I am a friend, they don't get what I'm talking about, and most especially, if I say I belong to the Religious Society of Friends, they really don't know what I'm talking about. 
One other way Quakers got in trouble was by refusing to take an oath. Quakers felt that by taking an oath, it inferred that they normally lied. One of the most important things to friends was and is telling the truth. My nay is nay and my yea is yea. The problem with that was by refusing to swear or refusing to swear on a Bible, they would really get in trouble. They could be imprisoned for that, but it didn't stop the Quakers. Today in court, you can affirm you don't have to swear or take an oath. You can thank the Quakers for that. Quakers were so persecuted that it was not unusual for them to be attacked by soldiers. Quakers were pacifists and did not even raise their arm in defense when attacked by soldiers, but allowed themselves to be beaten and knocked to the ground. Quakers have remained pacifists throughout many wars, which I will go into later. It's estimated in the second half of the 17th century that 4,000 plus Quakers were imprisoned and hundreds of them died in prison. Quakers believe that their faith should not simply be a mystical experience, but should result in a person working for the good of others. They did prison work and still do today. They work for peace and they work for social justice. Now, one of the unusual ideas of early friends was not calling months by the traditional names, that is January name for the Italian god Janus, February name for Fabria, a word denoting purgation by sacrifices, and March name for Mars, god of war, and so forth. And then there were the days of the week. Sunday, the first day of the week, was named for the adoration of the sun. Monday, the custom of worshiping the moon. Tuesday, honoring the idol Twisco. Wednesday, honoring the idol Woden. Thursday, honoring Thor. You get the idea. So, friends meet for worship on first day, not Sunday. Second day is when we start the work week. And then we have first month, second month. Now, Quaker children don't go to Sunday school. They go to first day school. From a book called More Quaker Laughter, the following was written. In lieu of 30 days has September, April, June, and November. The 4th, 11th, 9th, and 6th have 30 days to each affixed. And every other, 31, except the second month alone, which has but 28 in fine, Tell leap year gives it 29. The reason for friends refusing to use the accepted names of the months and days can be seen from the following minute of the London yearly meeting in 1697. That all friends keep to the simplicity of truth and our ancient testimony and calling the months and days by scripture and not by heathen. The Quaker language was called plain speech. And my father's sister, who was not brought up in a strict Quaker family, married her fifth cousin. He grew up in the 20th century speaking plain speech. And their son, my cousin, my first cousin, went to school on Long Island. And one day he came home very excited because one of his schoolmates spoke like he did, plain speech. Now, I've read his sister's letter to their father, and she was writing in plain speech when she was writing her father in the 1950s. But today, plain speech is a thing of the past, and a few, although a few American Quakers still say thee and thou to other Quakers. As Quakerism grew in England, Quaker missionaries traveled to spread the word. In 1656, the first Quaker missionaries came here two to each colony. The first two Quaker missionaries who came to Maryland were women. I had an ancestor, Anne Iyer, Ayers, who married Colonel Samuel Chu in Southern Maryland. She became a Quaker when the two missionaries came through. And I think she might've been the very first convert to Quakerism in the colonies. Now her father and her husband's father were Puritans who came to Jamestown in 1620. Now, remember, 
England, if you weren't an Anglican, you were a Puritan. It wasn't just the people who came to Massachusetts. Now, their parents had to get out of Virginia around 1650 when the English Civil War was raging. Her husband's father, John Chu, was a member of the House of Burgesses and had been for quite a few years. However, Virginia was a royal colony and didn't want Puritans there. And when England was in the middle of the Civil War, even if they were a member of the elected legislature, Virginia remained faithful to the crown. They left Virginia for Maryland where they could worship as they pleased. Women today owe a lot to Quakers in becoming thought of and treated as equal to men, even equal as missionaries to the new world but more on that later. And New England, anyone who said they were a Quaker was imprisoned and run out of the colony. Massachusetts refused to allow ships to land if they contained Quakers. After two Quakers were hanged in Massachusetts, a man caught the body of one before it hit the ground. And for that, he was banished from the colony. But friends kept coming. One man on Long Island, New York, John Bown, a farmer, built his Dutch English house in Flushing, Long Island in 1649. Although not a friend, he was thrown in prison in 1662 by the New Amsterdam sheriff at the order of the Dutch general Peter Stuyvesant. Stuyvesant. <laughs> New York was still in Dutch hands at that point. But he was thrown in prison for allowing friends to hold a silent meeting in his house. Bayon himself was not a friend. However, he was transported to England for trial, but was found not guilty and returned to New York. This was an important landmark for religious tolerance in the U.S. And the Flushing Remonstrance signed in Flushing, New York on uh, December 27, 1657, protested religious persecution. And eventually it led to the decision by the Dutch West India Company to allow Quakers and others to worship freely. As such, Flushing in Long Island claims to be the birthplace of religious freedom in the new world. I should mention that John Bell is one of my many ancestors. I've seen the house which still stands in Flushing, Long Island, New York today. It served eight generations of the Bound family and is worth a visit. It also was a stop in the Underground Railroad where slaves would find a place to hide. In England in the second half of the 17th century, friends endured repeated waves of persecution. Between 1652 and 89, Thousands of Quakers were imprisoned and hundreds died for their faith. But the fires of oppression didn't destroy the society. It only strengthened the resolve of the persecuted friends. Now I want to introduce to you William Penn, one of the few upper crust friends. He made friends with George Fox and one time when he was with him, Penn asked Fox, should I wear my sword? In those days, all gentlemen would wear a sword. And Fox answered, wear it as long as thou canst. Fox meant that when Penn realized that a sword was a weapon of war and he became a true friend, he would no longer want to wear it. He would then be a pacifist like other friends. William Penn was the son of Admiral William Penn, who was owned a substantial debt by the king. And when the Admiral died, his son, William Penn, inherited the debt owed his father. When William Penn realized how many friends were being persecuted, he got the idea of taking land in the colonies in lieu of money. King Charles II was delighted to give William Penn a large property in the colonies to satisfy the debt. Penn wanted to call it Transylvania, which referred to a wooded land, but it soon became Pennsylvania. And in 1681, he invited Quakers, Catholics, Anabaptists, Jews, and other marginalized people to come for freedom of religion and freedom from persecution. So 
So Pennsylvania soon became a religious haven where people could pr practice whatever religion they wanted. This was revolutionary. William Penn came on the ship Welcome with his family in 1682. Now I wanted to digress a minute. In doing genealogy, I thought that all of my Quaker ancestors became convinced friends while living in the colonies. Well, I went into the Pennsylvania Historical Society uh, probably 20 years ago, and I thought, hmm, now who should I work on today? Now, I had an ancestor who lived in Philadelphia in the 17th century, so I think I'll work on that line. That man, William Penn, was a physician from Wales, and I found a book about him. That was exciting. And much to my astonishment, I found that he was a convinced friend before coming to the colonies arriving on the ship with his close friend, William Penn, as well as being his physician. He erected the first brick house in Philadelphia and served as speaker of the first two Pennsylvania assemblies. Now, later in the week, while I was at the Quaker meeting in Philadelphia on the following first day, I asked where the old Quaker cemetery was. The person I asked, pointed his finger down and I didn't understand. And then I realized that the cemetery was under the meeting house, which was built in the first decade of the 19th century over the old Quaker burial ground. During the second half of the 17th century, friends developed a number of distinguishing characteristics. Prescribed uniforms evolved, simple, unadorned, white, gray, or black, plain clothes, Gray became known as Quaker Gray. The women were frowned on if wearing ribbons or if a curl escaped from under her bonnet, and men if they had extra buttons. Friends gathered to worship in simple buildings called a meeting house, not a church, coming to gather with no pre-planned order of service, no scripture readings or sermons, and with no worship leader, the congregation gathered in silence at a designated time. If one or more members felt called to God to preach or teach, they would do so. It was assumed anyone present could be divinely inspired to minister, even women, children, and servants. Although women and men sat on opposite sides of the meeting house, there was no barrier between them during the worship, and any minister or offered was heard by all. Friends, unlike other band sects, held their meetings for worship openly in their meeting houses and at their usual times. This blatant <laughs> violation of the law infuriated some of the established church, resulting in services being broken up by mass arrests and the destruction of their meeting houses. They were troublesome and unbanned bound unbending in their demands for religious freedom. Okay, back to William Penn. He came with his family, built a house like many other people he had invited. And when the Native American chief complained that land being settled was his tribe's property, Penn paid him for it. On one occasion after this happened, another chief came to claim that it was his tribe's land. Penn paid him for it. Quakers had an annual meeting in Philadelphia each year, and the Quakers who wanted to attend would leave their children with the Native Americans. They lived in peace together. Now, from the book, More Quaker Laughter, is the following story. A gentle Quaker hearing a strange noise in his house got up and discovered a burglar busy at work. So he went quietly and got his gun, then came back and stood in the doorway. Friend, he said, I would do thee no harm for the world, but thee is standing where I am about to shoot. <laughs> Quakers do have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Now I want to move into the 18th century, starting in Pennsylvania. The Religious Society of Friends was the third biggest religion in the colonies. The majority of the Pennsylvania legislature was made up of friends. However, before the American Revolution started, Quakers chose to withdraw because the demands of the state and the obligations of membership in the Religious Society of Friends 
was seen as too often incompatible, but they remained pacifist and refused to enter the war. Another reason that the Quaker population started to decline was that Quakers would not allow their members to marry out. If they did, they were disowned from the meeting. Sometimes a person's mate would become a Quaker and then the couple could be readmitted to meeting. However, this unfortunate custom over the next few years caused a decided decline in the Quaker numbers. Now, originally Quakers lived in isolated rural villages or farms and young members would only know other Quakers. But as the rural population declined and the urban population were on the rise, young friends met people of other faiths, fell in love with non-Quakers and married out. The result was a gradual decline in Quaker memberships. And in the Philadelphia yearly meeting during its founding and the Revolutionary War, 13 cases of dis uh, sorry, 13,000 cases of discipline were brought before friends. 5,000 inc incidents were concerning marriage to non-friends, resulting in disownment. Public drunkenness was another reason for being disowned. Now, regarding Quaker weddings, after the Clearness Committee okayed the marriage, the couple attend a silent meeting and then stands before the meeting and makes their vows to each other. There's no clergy involved. All the meeting and any visitors would sign a document saying that they were present. And we still do this today, although today music is sometimes part of the event. Another stronghold of Quakers was in New York and Long Island in particular. I want to introduce you to Elias Hicks, who was born on Long Island in 1748. He was one of six sons who moved in with his older brother at age 11 the summer after his mother died. He had very little supervision and almost without any restraint, he indulged in horse races, card playing, and other vain amusements. Later he wrote, I lost much of my youth, youthful innocence and became considerably hardened in sin and vanity. Solitary periods spent hunting and fishing provided frequent opportunities for quiet reflection. Moreover, he had the Lord as his constant companion. His wild youth reached its climax on a dance floor when Elias experienced what early generations of friends termed a day of visitation. He walked off the dance floor and reported, my soul was deeply sensible of its evil and folly and was stuck with a belief that if I now gave way from forming so many re resolutions and should again rebel against the light, I might be be left in an obdurate situation and never have another offer of pardon. Soon after this, his covenant with God and the Society of Friends, it was further sealed when he wed Jemima Seaman, whose parents owned a farm. Since their three sons had all died of what we know today as muscular dystrophy, Jemima and Elias inherited the farm when the Seamans died six years later. Sadly, Elias and Jemima's four sons died of the same disease. Although Elias could have made a good living as a carpenter for which he had apprenticed, this farm offered much better prospects and allowed him to become a traveling Quaker preacher at age 31. For if thou willingly surrenders thyself as an offering to God to do his will, as by the light in thy own heart and conscience. He is pleased to manifest it to thee. They understand, the, uh, thy understanding will be more and more opened into those things that concern thy present and everlasting peace. During Hicks's lifetime, there were many changes in society. There were probably 1 million people when he was born, but 12 million by the time he died, 82 years later. 200,000 people lived in New York City alone. Instead of most people living on small farms, more people lived in towns. Also, instead of one third of the people being Quakers by that time, by the time he died, 
There were more Methodist churches than there were post offices. There were Shakers, Catholic Sisters of Charity, Baptists, Deists, and Unitarians. Hicks' devotion to the principle of absolute submission to God's will and unwavering adherence to the practices of the Religious Society of Friends caused him to get permission from the Friends meeting before traveling. His first trip in 1779 was to settle a dispute within the New York yearly meeting. Elias and a group of friends were sent to Philadelphia yearly meeting for advice on how to settle it. He was chosen for this journey and it was the first of many journeys over the over 48 years, he made 50 major trips and dozens of smaller ones. He was so popular a speaker that some people would travel all day and for many miles to hear him speak. He founded and built Jericho Meeting House, which you can see is a typical plain meeting house. And I understand he built quite a bit of it himself since he was trained as a carpenter. On his last trip after his wife died, when he was 81 years old, he wrote, and in order to the accomplishment of the service above alluded to, I left home on my longest trip on the 28th of the fourth month and attended the three quarterly meetings of Purchase, Nine Partners, and Stanford, and the monthly meeting of Oblong and four particular meetings. In all these meetings, the Lord, our gracious helper, manifested himself to be near for our support making way for us at times when there seemed to be no way to our humbling admiration. He was in his buggy and started the trip to visit the Quaker yearly meeting in New York City, Philadelphia, Delaware, New Jersey, Baltimore, Ohio, Indiana, Western Pennsylvania, and Virginia. And remember, he was driving a horse and buggy. Now, Elias Hicks was against slavery to rob a rational being of his liberty and free agency is to rob him of everything valuable in this world that he could possibly possess or enjoy. He bought a slave in order to free him, gave him a job and left him something in his will. He was one of the governors of a school for black slaves. He knew that slave owning damaged the souls of the slave owners. I have mentioned how the world was changing and with it, there was a substantial change in the society of friends. The schism of 1827 was caused by what I have described had happened to the society and what can be descri described as between country friends and city friends. City friends wanted to ride in carriages and their fancy clothes. Country friends wanted to continue the old Quaker ways. The schism resulted in the Orthodox Quakers building Quaker churches with paid ministers who were more like other mainstream Christian religions. There's actually a friend's church in Whittier, which I visited while I was raising money for the Afghan Refugee Girls School, a Quaker charity. I spoke with one of the people and found his beliefs were much the same as what have become known as Hicksite Quakers which is what friends who worship in silence in plain houses believe. Obviously, Hicksite Quakers are called Hicksite after the teachings of Elias Hicks. Now, Edward Hicks, who was a Quaker preacher and a sometimes artist, an untrained artist, is famous for his many paintings called The Peaceable Kingdom. He painted quite a few of them and note the friends on the bottom left of the painting, the one holding the white handkerchief is his cousin, Elias Hicks. My sister and I went to an exhibition of his paintings and we saw a couple dozen peaceable kingdoms. The one painted in 1827 had the tree, which was in most of them, but in that painting, the tree was split in half, fallen to the ground. This represented the schism of the Religious Society of Friends and a schism still exists. A problem friends had was that farms had to be split when there were several sons or who got the farm. 
Some of the Long Island friends ended up as merchants in New York City. When this custom began, prices charged were all over the map. Quaker merchants worked differently. They figured out how much an item cost and how much profit they needed to make, and then they would set the price. One of the reasons Quaker merchants did so well is that people could trust them and what they were charging for their merchandise. My ancestor, who was Elias Hicks's son-in-law, Valentine Hicks, was one of the merchants along with his brother Isaac. At a certain point, Valentine decided he'd made enough money and retired to Long Island saying his $50,000 was enough and he would not do his family the disservice of leaving them rich. Valentine then had time to travel with Elias Hicks on trips and he and his wife, that is Valentine's wife, Abigail, could devote time to the Underground Railroad, using their large house to accommodate, accommodate those visitors. Another more famous Quaker was Lucretia Coffin Mott, born in 1793. Mm -hmm. She was a Quaker preacher, abolitionist, feminist, suffragist, teacher, and social reformer. She was born on Nantucket and attended Nine Partners Quaker School. After graduating, she taught there. Then she discovered the male teachers were paid significantly more than the female teachers. That started her on the path working for women's rights. She married one of the teachers at Nine Partners School, James Mott. He was a Quaker leader, teacher, and anti-slave activist. So Lucretia Coffin became Lucretia Mott. Books have been written about her, so I will just touch on some of her activities. If you want to see what she looked like, you can go to the U.S. Capitol to see her likeness in marble. She was amongst the women excluded from the World Anti-Slavery Convention held in London in 1840 because she was a woman. Eight years later, she was invited to a meeting that led to the first public gathering about women's rights. The Seneca Falls Convention held in New York, during which she co-wrote the Declarations of Sentiments, which outlined the rights that American women should be entitled to as American citizens. The Seneca Falls Convention was the first women's rights convention. Lucretia Mott considered slavery to be evil, and with friend Elias Hicks, she and other Quakers refused to use cotton cloth, cane sugar, and other slavery-produced goods. In 1821, she became a Quaker minister. With her husband's support, she traveled extensively as a minister, and her sermons emphasized the Quaker inward light, or the presence of the divine within each individual. Her sermons also included women's rights and anti-slavery sentiments. She and her husband founded the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1833 in Philadelphia. When the U.S. outlawed slavery in 1865, after the Civil War, she advocated giving former slaves, male and female, the right to vote. Once Lucretia was speaking at the Philadelphia Hall, which outraged a number of men because she was a woman. How dare a woman speak in Philadelphia Hall? This mob decided to burn her house down and start it out. But a friend of Lucretia saw the mob's intention and pointed them in the wrong direction. Her house was saved. She remained a central figure in the reform movement until her death in 1880. Her sister, Martha Wright, also was an abolitionist and became a close friend of Harriet Tubman. Another inspired and inspiring Quaker was John Woolman. He represents honesty and integrity. Integrity is one of the virtues for which Quakers in the past have been praised. It is a quality worth having, but it is doubtful if it can be reached by self-conscious effort or by adherence to a principle. John Woolman was a successful shopkeeper, but decided he was making a lot of money and having to spend too much time in the shop. So he decided to become a tailor 
which gave him an adequate income for his family and freed him up to do God's work. From his diary, John Woolman wrote, a neighbor desired me to write his will. I took note and amongst other things, he told me to which of his children he gave his young Negro. I considered the pain and distress he was in and knew not how it would end. So I wrote his will, save only that part concerning his slave and carrying it to his bedside, read it to him and then told him in a friendly way that I would not write any instrument by which my fellow creatures were made slaves without bringing trouble on my mind, my own mind. I let him char know that I charged him nothing for what I had done and desired to be excused from doing the other part as he proposed. And then we had a serious conference on the subject and at length he agreeing to set her free, I finished his will. Friendship, our name, the Religious Society of Friends suggests that we think of ourselves not only as friends in the truth, which the early Quakers saw themselves to be, but also as a society of friends, prizing friendship highly and recognizing its value for the religious life. And now I want to bring you up to date on the 20th and 21st centuries. Not nearly as interesting and fun, but more serious. Quakers continued as pacifists, refusing to fight, but many of them were paramedics and performed other service support services during a war. After World War I, Friends organized AFSC, American Friends Service Committee, which worked for a just, peaceful, and sustainable world free from violence, inequality, and oppression. After World War II, AFSC worked hard to feed the starving European children, and that included the starving German children at a time when people hated the Germans and were happy to let them starve, even the children. For that work in feeding these starving children, the American Friends Service Committee was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. Quakerism is a way of life, and we follow these testimonies. Integrity, equality, simplicity, peace, and community. Integrity. The inscription on George Fox's tombstone, let your lives speak. Unity. Friends believe that it is possible for the human spirit to be in direct communion with the divine. Seeking God's will to gather, we believe way will open and unity will emerge. Equality. Galatians 3, 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Simplicity. Simplicity is the right ordering of our lives, placing God at the center. When we shed possessions, activities, and behavior that distract us from that center, we can focus on what is important. Peace. George Fox, we utterly <clears throat> deny all outward wars and strife and fightings with outward weapons for any end or any under any pretense whatsoever. And this is our testament to the whole world. William Penn. A good end cannot sanctify evil means, nor must we ever do evil that good may come of it. And finally, community. Friends' testimonies on integrity, unity, equality, simplicity, and peace come together in our testimony on community, which calls us to sustain caring relationships for all. We still believe that there is that of God in everyone, and we all have an inner light. What we do with that light is our spiritual journey. I am the convener of the Caneo Valley Worship Group, which meets in my home on the first and third first days. Before COVID, we would drive to Orange Grove monthly meeting in Pasadena on the second first day. We we're under their care. The very plain meeting house built in 1907 
and I have I have spent many hours in silence there. Also within driving distance is Santa Barbara monthly meeting, which we attend on the fourth first day. And also within driving distance is a Santa Monica meeting. During COVID, we have worshiped on Zoom on the second and fourth first days, but worshiped on my patio with masks sitting six feet apart on the first and third first days. We have the monthly meetings, which meet every first day, and then the Southern California quarterly meeting, which meets twice a year, and California yearly meeting, which includes all of California and Hawaii. Now, every year, each meeting and worship group write a state of the meeting report, and I want to just read the one page, which is the one for the Caneo Valley Worship Group. State of the Meeting Caneo Valley Worship Group. We are now meeting on a regular basis with coronavirus on the wane, mostly on the patio, but in the living room if it's cold. We have a core of members who usually come on the first and third first days. Some of us go on Zoom to Orange Grove meeting. One member is still fundraising for empowering women and girls through education locally as well as internationally including a scholarship for the head of household in Kenya to complete her medical degree and pay for an internship. Another is still fundraising for the Ashina village in India, paying for a tutorial center for 20 children so they can go to college and one doing a college master's in bi microbiology, plus paying the medical expenses for a diabetic man so he won't lose his feet and also supporting a widow. Also in India, supporting home family, homeless, familyless, mentally ill peoples. One member is a home health hospice nurse and another participates in a food bank. One attends Cal State Channel Islands majoring in math. A joy is when he makes an A. Several people write to people in prison. One member is a program clerk for FCL California and has joined the Quaker State Level Action Network. She serves as the rep for Orange Grove Peace and Social Justice Concerns Committee too. A suggestion, uh, sorry, a discussion occurred regarding donations to Ukrainian people. Donations included Doctors Without Borders, UNICEF, Red Cross, and GoFundMe plus locally based shelter box. We are small in numbers, but mighty and good works. I hope thee has found my talk interesting, informative, and inspiring. Thank you, Pastor. My pleasure. As as Quakers going back to those wars where people were pacifists, did um, they have anything come from being pacifists? Did they go to jail? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. In the Civil War in um, England, one of the, really interesting that uh, George Fox met with Cromwell and there was a discussion. It wasn't too long after that that uh, Crom Crom Cromwell kind of disappeared and uh, the uh, established uh, royalty came back. Uh, that That's a whole, I, I could do another talk on that. <laughs> um, but during, you know, they refused to fight during the revolution. And that, that was really interesting because because they refused to fight, each side was suspicious of them. And um, they didn't do very well during the revolution because of that, because the patriots were suspicious of them because they wouldn't fight. And of course the uh, English were suspicious of them because they wouldn't fight. <laughs> so, um, But even up into 20th century, they would not fight yeah. and they ended up in jail. But because... I, I have a, fr a, fr a Quaker friend who, who's now dead. He's quite a lot. He was quite a lot older than I, but he had been 
uh, a person who refused to fight. And I forget now exactly what he did, but he worked. The, the government gave him a job to do. That was an important job, but he wasn't fighting. But right. it was a job that was essential. They, uh, I think after World War I, they made accommodations for special projects they could do. Yes. You still had to serve, but you didn't fight. Right. And I think this friend of mine uh, during World War II, somehow in, in my mind, he worked for the forest department or, or something like that. I can't quite remember. Yeah. And I can't ask him. So. Oh, yeah. It might be hard to communicate. So one of the questions that was asked the other night was about sacraments, because Liturgical churches like Episcopalian, Lutheran, have what we call sacraments of baptism, um, wedding vows, and communion, and so do the LDS churches, um, and different other faiths have different practices they do. Are there any particular practices for Quakers? There's nothing. Uh, Quakers do not believe in symbols. They believe that takes away from the God in everyone. So they have no symbols at all, no liturgical practices at all. No baptism, mm -hmm. no communion. No, not in a wedding, the couple, will, they have a silent meeting, as I said, and then the couple, when, when it feels right to them, gets up before the meeting and makes their vows to one another. But there's no minister involved. Now, in today's world, they have to register the marriage with the state. Right. But, that's a, that's a legal thing, no, anyway. But the weddings are, are great fun, and I I love it, and I wish I had been able to. We have one in my family, but I can't figure out who inherited it. Um, they would have a paper stating who was married, and then all the people who attended the wedding signed the paper. And the idea was that the people who were there would would give help to the couple if they needed it. And that was why they signed the paper. So the, the couple would remember who was at the wedding. And uh, I, I love that. I love that practice. And today, I guess, actually, when you go to a regular wedding, people sign a guest book. Yeah. It's a little bit like that. But, it's but a little some, bit like that. Some of the uh, the old uh, papers and, and people signed in, in Know, like 19th century script and everything that was kind of fun and I we um, it was uh, at Orange Grove meeting in approximately uh, 1983 they made a stand for people who were gay and they okayed not only the people coming to meeting but the people married in meeting and I went to one of the most delightful weddings I've ever been to. Uh, uh, two gay men were married, I guess, 10 or 15 years ago. One of them was a good friend of mine, and um, it was just a very joyous event. And, of course, I believe in that. They were recognizing that in 1983. In they 1983, were... that was when Orange Grove recognized it as a meeting. Now, there were a lot of discussions. It just didn't all of a sudden happen. And I understand a couple of the families left the church because, oh, sorry, left the meeting because they just did not agree with that. But there's been a huge change. There, certainly the majority of Americans now agree with being gay or even gay marriage. Not all Americans, but a good many of them. It's a good, yeah, it's changed that way. Right. So there is, um, I'm not sure you mentioned it in this one, but before somebody would get married back in 1800, they went to a clearance. A clearness meeting. committee. A clearness and, and so before, well, we used the clearness committee and it's set up ahead. Um, for example, when I uh, decided I wanted to become a member of Orange Grove, I'd been attending for a couple or three years. I went before a clearness committee and explained to them why I wanted to be a full member. And the same thing when you're married, you go before a clearness committee. And um, if if they find that there's a reason they don't think the couple should marry, they will not allow them to be married in the meeting. I've never heard of it happening in, in my time, but I'm sure. 
Sure. It's a really nice idea because it the couple has a chance to think about the marriage and all it entails. And then the clearness committee is made up of, I don't know, four or five people and they ask questions. So uh, there's very little that's done in the Quaker meeting that it doesn't go before a committee. I mean, <laughs> if they want a different set of curtains or something, <laughs> anything done to the meeting house has to go before a committee and be okayed. And then, um, and on the second first day we have, after we have at Orange Grove, we have the meeting for worship, then we have some food, and then we regather in the room for meeting for worship on the occasion of business. We still keep some of those old terms, which I love. Uh, and then they they have discussions. It can be whether they have to earthquake of uh, uh, I didn't quite understand this, but they had to sort of tie the the old building. I think it was in 1907, tie it down in case of an earthquake. It wouldn't uh, be destroyed. Over. And so that comes before the committee to do with the grounds and the meeting house. And then it goes before the whole body during meeting for business. And, um, and there are disagreements. And sometimes they never can come up with a, an agreement. So, in fact, that's what happened with the schism. The, uh, what is now called Orthodox Quakers wanted a minister and they wanted a church and they couldn't come to any reconciliation. So the Orthodox went off on their own and the Hicksite Quakers stayed as Hicksite Quakers. And all of the meetings in in California that I know of, uh, most of them are Hicksite meetings, but I, somebody was telling me about an Orthodox meeting. And then there's the Friends Church in Whittier. Mm -hmm. I've never been to their service, but I was there once. And I didn't talk much about the Afghan girls' school, but um, we it was under the care of the Quakers. And um, we have the school for almost two decades for girls only, but it got so dangerous. It was, low, it was for refugee girls, so it was located in Pakistan. And it got to the point where we we couldn't visit it anymore because it was too dangerous. The last time it was visited, the um, person had to be moved to a different house each night because they were afraid for her safety. And it got to the point where we couldn't visit anymore. And then with no oversight, the man who was called the head teacher, but he was what we'd really call a principal, was walking off with money. And there was nothing we could really do about it because we couldn't visit. So we right. finally laid, the, uh, laid it down. But anyway, I do know that a lot of, of the girls learned to read and write, and some of them uh, went on to college, high school or college, not a big percentage, because there was still a distrust of higher education for girls. But most of the men did definitely want their girls to learn to read and write. So, but uh, our standards in this country, I guess it, it wasn't a lot of education, but for that, for Afghan girls, it was. Well, and they earned a sewing machine if they got to six, through sixth grade. That, that's right. And we encouraged the sewing machines because that way the girl had a way to earn a living and wouldn't, uh, was a little more independent than if she didn't have any way to earn a right. living. Mm -hmm. And of course, in a lot of societies, in our society, if you go back 120 or 30 years, all women knew how to sew and uh we had my grandmother's sewing machine when I was growing up, and that sewing machine would date back to the late 19th century and work fine. My mother used to make some of our clothes on it. And my grandmother did beautiful embroidery. Oh, my gosh, I've still got quite a few of her pieces. But that's a thing of the past, how many women today sew in this country. Right. Yeah. I used to. So... Um... Part of the Quaker traditions is, you know, the LDS, Latter-day Saints, have some food restrictions. 
different uh, Hindus are often vegetarian. Are there any food restrictions for Quakers? No. Um, we, Muslims we, don't drink, right? Alcohol. Right. Now, it's not that Quakers can't, uh, is, aren't supposed to drink, but during Quaker meetings or get to gathers, there's no alcohol served. We're very conscious of what alcohol can do. And you remember I said that some of the Quakers who were out in public and drunk were read out of meeting. It was definitely frowned upon. But, right. but we don't have any uh, restrictions. I think you'll find that most Quakers eat pretty healthy foods. Um, but it's it's not set by the Quakers. And but you I, talked about the dress. <laughs> Uh, no. Way back when, obviously, yeah. Percy, you you don't dress in gray anymore. No, <laughs> <laughs> but it is interesting that my my everyday dress this this is a fancy blouse I have, but my everyday dress I I dress pretty plainly as you probably know. Um, when you go to our meeting, I think you'll find that most of the women are, you know, dressed fairly plainly. But colors are fine. And one of the fun, there's so many things about the Quakers that are so much fun to poke your finger at them and laugh. I love that book, The um, Quaker Wit. I, I read that from cover to cover and had a big laugh. I wish I could have quoted it more. Um, but um, uh, George Fox, after the the Religious Society of Friends was really going, married the widow of Judge Fell. And on one occasion, he sent her a bolt of red uh, material to, to, to uh, sew a dress or dresses for her family. And it just seems so funny now. It was only later, and I can't tell you exactly when it happened, but I think it, I think it was sort of maybe toward the end of the, of the uh, 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century. That's when the plain, plain clothes came in. And, uh, and there were some really funny things I could have added uh, about what, what somebody would be wearing and people would be frowning about it, you know, too many ribbons and that kind of thing. Some of it's pretty amusing. If you don't have a sense of humor in this life, whether it's about your religion or anything else, you lose a lot. You lose a lot. Well, and they may have looked at it, and I don't know if this is true or not, but they may have looked at it as they were people who cared and wanted other people to have as much as they did. So spending more money for more ribbons and fancy dress may have been part of the basis. Well, that might have been, yeah. And you know, I... And this is a Quaker thing, but it's not because I'm a Quaker. My partner said to me the other day, did I take care of him when he had his open heart surgery because I was a Quaker? And I said, no, that's just who I am. It was like, and I didn't say it in this talk, but um, when I went to Philadelphia and I, I, I was an Episcopalian, I went to Philadelphia and we went by, we were headed back to the car after a day of sightseeing and we walked by a meeting house that I knew that Elias Hicks had uh, preached in. And I said, oh, I just want to go in there. And I went in and asked the man there if there was a Quaker presence in the Canal Valley. And when I came back and made the phone call, I went to my first Quaker meeting. And I, at the end of the hour, I realized I'd been a Quaker all my life. I just hadn't known it. Yeah. It just was such a good fit for me. And it's just who I am. And another thing I didn't mention in this talk was that my father had a flower farm in Virginia and the parole board called him one day and he said, uh, they said to him, would you be willing to give a job to this African-American prisoner we have? Because if he can find a job, we will let him out of prison. And my father and mother took, took them up on it. And Eugene worked for us until he died. Um, he was, uh, Kind of a, he probably had an IQ of 85, may, maybe that much. And he had, at the, uh, a, an older man had uh, gotten him in, and I think he was about 17 or something or other when Eugene 
they they robbed somebody they knew very well and they didn't even have the brains i mean first of all they didn't have the brains to do it they didn't even have the brains to wear a mask so they held the man up and the man of course knew exactly who they were and of course they both ended up in prison i mean do <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I thought to myself when my father uh, agreed to take Eugene and give him a job, I thought Elias, who would have been his great, great, great grandfather, would really have approved. Oh, and another thing, this was interesting. Um, the, the British decided to outlaw the slave trade. And Elias Hicks was absolutely furious because they didn't free the slaves in England. They stopped the, the trade of bringing in new slaves, but they didn't free the slaves that were already in England. And he was absolutely furious about it. Anyway, he, he was, uh, like most Quakers, very strongly against uh, slavery. And that man whose name I was trying to think of the other night was Benjamin Lay. He was an odd duck. Um, a man from England, and he and his wife had lived in the, the Barbados, which was one of the, I mean, if you were going to be a slave, that was the last place you wanted to be a slave. Anyway, they, he and his wife left and went back to England and then came to Philadelphia to live. And uh, Benjamin Lay was so adamant against slavery that he would stand out at the door when the Quakers were leaving and talk to them very sternly and not very diplomatically about they should free their slaves. And he honestly was the reason that all of a sudden it dawned on these Quakers that they shouldn't have slaves. Not all of them did. And of course, some of them already didn't believe in slaves, but he really awakened this, the uh, Quakers about the evils of slavery. And he, I have a, a sketch of him. He was a really funny look at, looking man. I think he was about four and a half feet tall and kind of stooped over and um, not prepossessing in his looks. But uh, he, it is funny when you think about it that sometimes it's the queer ducks in the world who can get things started, get things done. It's really, really interesting. Tim and I are queer ducks, so in our way. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. Oh, I think I am a bit, but I don't worry too much about it. But not like Benjamin Lay. I mean, I'm not going to yeah, be out yeah. in front of the uh, the church preaching against um, people who are against things that I won't mention. <laughs> right. So one one more question, and I'm not sure it was clear for everybody, but because of the Quaker meeting is different than churches and right you might want to give a little description of what occurs in a quaker meeting well when i go to orange grove meeting i walk in and um and i i settle in now the quaker meeting is an absolutely plain room no it has windows and all quaker meetings have a lot of light and i sit down and we have benches when when Orange Grove was started in the early 20th century, there were Quaker meetings all over the East Coast that sent benches. And so our benches, are, uh, and one of them is the uh, from the meeting, Westbury, which is where most of my ancestors are buried, Quaker ancestors. And it was where Elias Hicks used to attend and then it was about eight miles from the Jericho meeting, which he then broke away so people didn't have to travel so far. But anyway, they sent one of the benches at Orange Grove meeting. I was just so delighted to see it. Anyway, they uh, sometimes changed these. And in the old Quaker meetings, they had what was called the facing bench. And uh, that would be the bench where the elders sat and they would be looking at everybody in the meeting and in those years um the meeting might the quiet meeting the silence might last for two hours but one of the people on the on the facing bench would turn to the man next to him and shake his hand and then all the quakers would shake the hands of the people on either side and that was the end of the 
the quiet time. Now today, it's set for an hour. And so at the end of the hour, there's a, a person who stands up and asks if there are any spiritual afterthoughts. And then they uh, make announcements of what's going on uh, in the future. And then usually uh, they adjourn and have a little food and fellowship. So that is pretty typical in all Quaker meetings now, the Hicksite Quakers. Nice. Okay. <clears throat> is there anything else you want to add before we conclude? Oh, I could go on for several hours more, but I think everybody's had enough. <laughs> Maybe. So um, thank you for sharing and taking the time. It and, was my pleasure. Um, very glad you were a part of the Ventura County Interfaith Community. And I'm glad you're my friend, Terry. That you too. To me. Very, very much. Okay. Bye-bye.